Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Capital Program Committee meeting Thursday, September 7th, just after 1 p.m. Call this meeting to order. Uh, roll call present in the room Barry, QJ, Howard, Gil, and I was north from the Capitol here. And online, we have no members present. There's somebody online. Is that Chip? Yeah. Hello. Okay. Um, nope. uh, Chip, we're, I'll go through our agenda and then we'll give you a quick notice that we're going to call out to you. Okay. Thank you. So this video, uh, this meeting is being audio video recorded and we broadcast on the town's YouTube channel. It's also on Zoom. Um, please don't say or display anything you don't want broadcast. It can make for very interesting viewing at a later date. Uh, can we get a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Uh, all members present, we can vote in person. No favor, say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? It's adopted. Um, there are no members of the public present. <laughs> we will not have a public comment session. Uh, next item on the agenda is FY25 capital requests and out your discussion for natural resources and school department. So we'll take them in the order they appear on the agenda. Um, Jeff will be first. Jeff, uh, feel free, please, um, <coughs> to belly up here, grab yeah, seat at the gentlemen, table. Gentlemen, I'll, down. I'm going to sit next to Jill because she's the nicest one. <laughs> I just sit next with PJ and Stephen yesterday. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, right yeah, out, yeah. Yeah. and they were smelly, right? Sweet, so they... <laughs> I don't know if it smells are usually not a concern because at least it wasn't like it's oyster a little bucket. Yeah. yeah, we have oyster buckets and all kinds of nasty stuff <laughs> around. True. So. Unintended. The bar is pretty high up there. Yeah, we yeah. have a pretty high tolerance for <laughs> kind of gross in our, our world. Um, what we'd like to do, Jeff, is uh, walk through from top to bottom, left to right for FY25. So there are like five requests. Sure. And I think what I'd like to do, I mean, where we're going with this ideally is members have previewed the detailed information provided and we're simply asking questions. Um, but I think given the um, given the fact that we're televised and some people get a chance to understand what the requests are, I just want to do a brief introduction to each project. If we have questions, we'll do the question and then we'll move on to the next one. Sure thing. And uh, for the record, uh, please let the record reflect uh, Brooke is in attendance. Hey, Brooke, how are you? Good. Doing all right. All right, so I'll, I'll try to do them as, as quickly as I can just for the, uh, the FY25 mm -hmm. uh, programs uh, and right from the top. So the first project is the Folgers Marsh Bridge project. Uh, just to kind of locate everybody, Folgers Marsh Bridge is the culvert that is currently next door to the life-saving museum and connects that creek system off of Nantucket Harbor to that marsh across the way. Mm -hmm. um, that road is currently located below flood elevations, not even including sea level rise and potential threats from sea level rise. So we are starting to look at that as far as a potential isolation risk should that get flooded out or washed out uh, for Walwinnick, Quinnet, and Pulpus. Uh, you know, that northern area there, especially given that we've had lost that road by Sackage Pond in storms before. Uh, this is another area of concern in the hazard mitigation plan and the coastal resiliency plan. This is to look at raising that out of the flood zone uh, and increasing the ability for those floodwaters to get from the northern side where it's open creeks over to the marsh side um, and maintain that kind of saltwater meadow that's there. Um, that's currently maintained. So kind of restoring that more natural system. Um, below that, the strategic retreat and relocation program is also something from the coastal resiliency plan. And what that is, is really developing not only strategies for the town, but strategies for private homeowners to be able to streamline the process to retreat and relocate from vulnerable areas due to erosion and flooding. Um, and hopefully streamline some permitting processes and give them the tools to make that difficult time as easy as possible, especially uh, leaving the area that you probably wanted to be in. Um, to jump down, we don't have any in hazard mitigation this year. Just to touch on, we moved a couple out of those. 
uh, the Madigan Long Pond Hardening Projects. We've moved back a couple of years to try to sync up with potential um, sewering discussions and some other resiliency discussions for Madigan. Um, we thought that it was prudent instead of going forward with those to wait until those other projects were a little further along in concepting or design phase uh, to try to link it all up. Back to our regular list, uh, the ones we have listed for this year for FY25, uh, the climate action plan is something that while we're updating our hazard mitigation plan, the Commonwealth has synced up their climate action plan and the state hazard mitigation plan. We already have an active hazard mitigation plan is this is doing the other half of it for how Nantucket is going to start to adapt our current practices to start meeting the 2050 goals that the Commonwealth have for everything from greenhouse gas emissions to energy efficiencies to electric fuels to kind of put that together and through our sustainability lens, uh, build that program out to give people some targets to shoot at for, for goals and programs. Um, the next one down, the environmental justice policy development. I apologize for it being called environmental justice. It's a state and federal name, um, but what it is, is it's a program that we're looking to put together to find better ways to bring our six math environmental justice communities more into the fold for planning and project development and addressing their needs and their resiliency needs uh, more so. That was a project that we kind of are spinning out of the town's original DEI initiative. Um, and what we're really seeing and what's really hampering us right now, every state grant and most federal grants at this point have some level of environmental justice component that's required as part of the grant. And not having that program really off and running here is starting to be a hindrance to those. And we're starting to see other communities kind of look at it the same way. And I would love to be able to get the points for those in grant applications for being able to successfully complete that category. And even more so, in communities that are generally Excuse underserved. Me, Jeff. Uh, Chip, can you mute, please? Thank you. Ooh. Go ahead, Jeff. Sure. And then, but not least, uh, this was one that was approved last year and is kind of an ongoing project every year. Um, we call it our baseline environmental data program, but it's really just our data collection program where we do all of our water quality monitoring, our eelgrass base scallop, whelk assessments, we do groundwater monitoring, stormwater monitoring, all of the data that we collect in natural resources to help fuel design of projects, but more importantly from our end, evaluate after we've taken either a management strategy or a project development to evaluate whether it's working or not, or what tweaks or changes we need to do. And it's just kind of our, <clears throat> the data we collect just to kind of stay in the game for all of our project development. So that's really it for us. That was the 180 second summary. Questions. Oh, I just quick recap for folks at home uh, watching capital program do its process. Uh, these requests are completed into a database, which provides an opportunity and um, resource for capital program committee, finance committee, select board members. Uh, obviously the department had to review the information provided in detail. And uh, that allows us to use our time efficiently and also the department has so that they don't have to um, come start from scratch at zero, inform us of what the project is, and then uh, wait around for our questions to kind of percolate up. So with that having been said, which I'll probably say one more time is, is we're back into the um, process. Uh, are there questions? Um, I just ask if there's questions, we go topic by topic. So any questions uh, for Jeff on Folgers, Marsh, Bridge? Um, Has there been flooding there yet? Yes, in that same storm that we washed out Pulpus Road at Sackage Pond, Folgers Marsh was overtopped for a period of time and there was a couple hours of time where that area north of there was geographically isolated from storm damage. Doesn't happen often, but I would don't want to be there the one time where it happens and we can't get there and something happens. Mm -hmm. So is it a big issue? Is it inconvenience a lot of people? Long term, yes. I think as we see time pass and especially with sea level rise projections, 
the flooding there is going to become more and more common and overtopping that's more and more common. We're also starting to see that culvert beneath the road have some wear and tear and start to fail. If you actually walk out there, you can see where the roadways depressed on top of it, where that culvert started to crack. So it requires some maintenance soon anyways, um, but it's one of those with costs getting higher and higher. It seems to be a project that the sooner the better to, so to get so to. If you did an interim fix, it would cost how much? How the, are, I'm sorry, interrupt. Right. Uh, just for procedural stuff, um, please try and project so it gets picked up in the minutes. And also, just please, and uh, wait to be recognized so I can say your name so that if we end up going with AI, the AI picks it up because our professional minutes taker for some number of decades retired some months ago, and it's been a struggle for minutes not to have a clear process in place. Yes, so, it has. Sorry to interrupt you. I would have, I think I would have saw it. Yeah. Uh, Sue, if you don't mind um, muting, please. Stephen, no. um, can you check to see if there's anyone in the waiting room? Brian called me and said there's three people, or I'm sorry, a couple people in the waiting room. Right. We have uh, Beth Hallett and Martin Angelo are in there. Can we get invitations to them? Okay, guys, let's back up. We're in the middle of natural resources, and when we get to um, procedural matters dealing with the school, We'll get everybody in, okay? Thank you. All right, Howard, please continue. So my question was, if you didn't do anything of the scale of the million two and you did something immediate, what's the cost relative? I don't have that number off the top of my head, but I'll get that and submit that to you. It's kind of a, a question is, is it, is it a significant portion of the million two anyway? Yeah, I think to replace a culvert in there between design and permitting and installation, you would probably be within at least 75% of that. And you need to do that anyway Correct. immediately, right? On a more immediate nature. I mean, I'm not sure how fast that culvert will absolutely fail, mm -hmm. but I, I, I think we're starting to see signs of it. And I think we'd like to take care of it proactively, but I would like to talk to Drew at DPW for what he feels that would be as far as them doing that work, because that's something that they would be doing. But I can certainly get that yeah. better number for you and submit that. So I think I was thinking if you hold off and you just put a bandage on it, is the cost so uh, material that it makes no sense to do a bandage? I think yes, personally, just for the fact that we're seeing things change so rapidly for flooding and increased flooding and increased opportunity for flooding that you're putting a Band-Aid on and you're going to stretch that project out 10 years. And there's definitely some risk in that time that that road gets overtopped and damaged further in there that right now and cost for, you know, doing a project of this nature where even if you're just doing a series of, you know, box culverts or larger culverts or increasing that connection that the cost for that now are certainly not going to go down. And I think that the percentage that it's going to go up is faster than what you're going to benefit from trying to do a repair in the short term. But I'll get that number for sure to confirm that. Thank you. That's an excellent question. Then. Uh, anyone else questions or follow-ups for Barry? Yeah, John. so state and federal grants available? Yes. Anything like this? Okay. Yeah, we definitely always look for state grant opportunities for this. I know yeah. we applied into... Um, both the MVP program and uh, Coastal Zone Management program for yeah. grants for for this project. Sure. But again, we also know that those are competitive. So we yeah. try to also kind of dual track. And if we end up saying, well, we got a grant to cover, um, all the better. But at least we're still moving forward. So as a follow up to that is, have you just out of curiosity, you talked to Mike Burns and see if there was any programming under the Transportation Improvement Program to... Yeah, the last project we talked about with, with bike in that area, we've been talking a lot about Walt Winter Road, obviously, for that bike path. Sure. Um, and Vince in our office, uh, Mike and I talk pretty regularly. We're pretty good about sharing grant opportunities <laughs> okay. through that grant. Uh, we haven't seen one that has come through transportation that fits a project like this quite yet. But okay. at any point, I mean, I get I feel like I get like a grant opportunity a day in my inbox from somewhere. Uh, and we'll kick the tires on any other. Yeah, no, I was just trying to extend beyond what 
who's out. Uh, there. We look for in cases like this. We've even looked as far as like preservation of access to the light saving to the life saving museum sure. and like a cultural resource if there are other opportunities available. Yeah, that's right. Um, obviously, we've talked to a lot. Of, like Conservation Foundation owns that marsh, and then Egan Maritime owns the life saving museum. You know, look to them as partners to sign on to those projects. Um, we've worked a little bit with one of the private homeowners on Foley Mill Road um, for trying to scope this a little bit and do some initial design and that relationship dissolved with different project objectives. That happens, but at least uh, we have them as a resource to Thank you. Brooke and then Holly. So uh, just to follow up, so you have grant applications in the pipeline? Yes. Okay. But uh, just to clarify on that point before we move forward, your request currently is not contingent upon receiving those. You're asking for the full amount. Correct. Give them, you'll be updating the request. Yes. Okay. Howard? Did I understand, Steve, that you said there are underpinnings for these numbers, some place that I could look at? Yeah. So if you're in your raw review, uh, there's a, in the right hand column, there is a uh, category supplemental, doc supplemental documents. Yes. And then that'll give you so background go, details. Go into or is it, uh, it depends on what, if you're in a tag. I got a bunch. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, any other questions on, um, so any questions on the strategic retreat and relocation so, program? I guess, because that's the okay. Don't wait. I would say, too, if anyone has any questions, too, feel free to email or call or stop by. I'm happy to oh, give the people information. Background, everything. Thank you. Now we're we're taking a momentary technical and striking break. With the policy. Will you um yeah, Phil Brooke, right. get yeah. into the roar? Yeah. Uh so this is the job website. Oh she doesn't. So uh Sue, um if uh if an email hasn't gone out and maybe it didn't it just got lost so to Brooke this website for access to Plum, the Nantucket Capital Request.org website. Um would you mind resending that? With her uh, username and password. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I'm fairly sure I did, and I'm happy to resend it after the meeting. Okay, Thank perfect. You. Thank you so Sorry, much. Sir. You're welcome. Just while we're in the technical, I don't want to get into the meeting room stuff yet, but I just want to broadcast to you, Sue. In the Zoom interface here, there is only a window for participants available. There isn't a meeting room area to let people in, so we can get we can revisit that as we wrap up. Uh, natural resources. I just want to let you know there's a potential issue. So if there's anything you got to look at, you can do that while we're still talking. I have the same issue on my end, Stephen. That was why I couldn't let anybody in. I couldn't see it either. What I think the issue might be is um, the way our meetings are set up is it automatically also sends a Microsoft Teams link. So it's possible they're on that and not on the Zoom. So um, hopefully, um, I asked Chip if he could possibly, well, I sent him an email, if he could reach out to Martin and Beth and ask him if they're on the wrong platform. Okay, and then Chip, if, if it wasn't already stated, go ahead and forward the uh, Zoom link that's on the agenda if you have it. If you don't have it, please shake your head no, Sue will see it, and she can send the Zoom link to the other potential participants. Okay, um, back to where we were. Uh, Strategic retreat and relocation program. Any questions for Jeff at this time on that? Uh, keep in mind, we can always revisit these if you haven't had an opportunity to look at the supplement, supplemental information, um, depending on the level of questions or the, their material or non-material nature. We can either have Jeff come back briefly or we can do it via email through staff. Email. Do it being on um, by Barry? Just a real quick question on that then. Is the state pretty much solidified in their plan that they're asking you to, to produce now? Or is that still subject to... Uh... The state, I always feel like, is... Uh, this is recorded, so I'll say it carefully. The state, I always feel like, is a little bit behind where we are. Okay. Uh, but they are trying their best to keep up. So you would be fair game without trying to put you on the spot and you don't have to answer it. Um, 
to say we're pretty much ahead of where we should be with this? I think the fact that we already have a coastal resiliency plan, I think puts us miles ahead of a lot of other communities and the Commonwealth in some cases. Yeah. <clears throat> but we also have the most amount of coastal area in the Commonwealth too. So, yeah, yeah, so it makes some sense. Okay, thank you. So my follow-up on that just while it's topical is it's good that we're positioned that way because given the amount of the dollar amount of funding we're going to require, we need to be poised as a community, obviously, as your department, for grant and program writing to get proposals in so that they're almost, in a sense, in terms of the administrative side, shovel ready, even though they're not shovel ready in the field, so we can get in there quick. Absolutely. The money is. Um, climate action plan? One question. Yeah, go ahead, Howard. So when I look at this, and you have numbers for design, does that mean like you've gone out and gotten an estimates of design? So everything through the CRP, any project that was there was a formal estimate was provided by our contractor at the time for what they were valuing that to be. Super. Uh, climate action plan, any questions for Jeff on this? Uh, go ahead, Joel. Just because I don't, there's so many different requests. Like, yes. And some of them seem like there's a lot of crossover. Yes. Right, because we have this umbrella of our own climate uh, crack plan, I guess. Correct. And so is there going to be overlap and all that kind of information like with the climate action plan? Don't, I guess when I read it last night and I actually went in and read the the state's climate action plan to the supplemental documents that you had. About, yes. Um, did they, I, when I'm reading it, I felt like we have a lot of that information. We do. And there's a lot of overlap between something like the climate action plan and everything from, um, you know, open space plan, resiliency plan, hazard mitigation plan, master plan. Right. Um, I'll go on to days and days of our list of plans. <laughs> um, so some of these with goals for like a plan like the climate action plan is to also fill in the necessary gaps that need to be filled in to bridge those things together. Sometimes it's also providing a little bit of the hub of the wheel for all of those things to come together. Right. So when we're looking at developing a project that may be identified through the coast resiliency plan, that the aspects that are necessary through the climate action plan can be applied. Or as we're looking at transportation planning, that there may be parts of the climate action plan that help fuel that planning process too. Okay. But right now we just, just as like a really small example, we don't really have any greenhouse gas emission goals for the town that are really formally adopted or put together. Right. But as we look at, you know, state goals and state transportation planning and even state resource use, those goals are underway and in development. We don't necessarily have the same traditional ways to address those that a community like New Bedford would have or someone on the mainland where they can deal with other things we're kind of limited to what we have in developing programs that target our specific impacts is hopefully what this will start to get to. So this plan is for everybody on Integrit. It's not just the town's goals for the town. Correct. Yeah, it'll be you a... said the town and then later it, it says the Integrit and I'm like, well, I don't know what that meant. So I, I think it would more goals for what the town buildings and facilities and cars and I think, yes, that would definitely be a component, but I, I think also, you know, you're always trying to develop a framework that other organizations or private citizens can use and adopt as well. Um, yeah. There may be ways to, you know, put regulatory requirement to it. There may be ways to do voluntary compliance. I think it depends on the goals, but I think it's also, you know, a little bit of a lead by example opportunity for the town to say, we're taking these steps to do these things. This is how we're doing it. Yeah. You guys should follow along too. Gotcha. Good. Okay. Makes sense. Okay, helpful. Thanks. Any other questions on this one? Okay, so um, environmental justice assessment and policy development. Um, Jeff, maybe you just give us a little bit of just a brief background on how the geographic aspect, how it's been determined, what this is, how it's been determined, and then how you're looking at connecting those geographic areas, not necessarily the areas themselves, but the oh, within them sure. to each of these projects. I just want to say one thing in, in a, as a framework, a conceptual matter. 
not unlike how we have criteria that are ranked and they have a particular point value, the environmental justice um, aspect is now part of the state's criteria. So if you don't have a component that translates on a particular project like Folgers Marsh Bridge, you're automatically not getting a percentage of the points that would otherwise be available. Yeah. So we had some discussion about Jeff, uh, about this topic with Jeff yesterday. Uh, please, Jeff, go ahead. So, sir, I brought handouts for people. I've also submitted this to Susan just before this meeting for her to update the, the online version. It's really simple. I won't run through it page for page because it's will put you to sleep. And I apologize for the map not being in color. I thought I had printed it in color and it didn't come out. So the first one is just the kind of the map of the six environmental justice communities on Nantucket. Um, so they look at them through the lens of a census block. Mm -hmm. So when we re-updated the, the 2020 census, they carved Nantucket up into a bunch of little pieces. And when they look at those blocks, if you look at the map on the second page, it kind of gets into why it's maps and what it's for. So when they're looking at the criteria of minority within the environmental justice viewer, they're looking at, um, essentially they're looking for non-white residents through the census window to be at a certain percentage to qualify or it's also based on median household income or English as a second language, um, or I think they actually refer to it as language isolation. And when they apply that, they look at those criteria to determine that. So if it helps, I also attach the environmental justice policy from the state on here. Um, it can be a bit of a tough read, um, but this is how the state is viewing this lens and a lot of this has great broad statements like agencies shall develop. So they are telling us that we have to identify and engage these communities and we have to, but you're on your own to figure out how to do that and find the resources to do that. So best of luck to everybody. Um, it's another one of those great state programs that does that. Uh, I know it's something that we've spent a lot of time with um, both Roberto and Jericho in the Health and Human Services Office. We've talked with uh, Kamal in the DEI office quite a bit about this, and environmental justice is just an area that we really struggle with because we haven't developed the strategies that the state is telling us that we need to develop to do. Um, it's really interesting. I would definitely tell anyone to take 10 minutes and talk to Jericho in the human services office about the struggles during COVID in outreach to really these six mapped areas. And when we look at it from our lens, it's how are we making those communities not only environmentally resilient, but how are we also getting them at least fair and equitable access to the resources that are necessary for people to engage in the natural resources here. Um, and it can be as simple as public access opportunities, or um, one of the requests we get all the time is we get complaints because guys get tickets for fishing and taking stuff that's not legal, that the signage that's provided for size of fish and number of fish are only in English. Right. And we understand that there are those problems in doing that, but we also know that um, what we hear through our other state plans, like right now we're working through the Harbor Plan update and there's a component of environmental justice that's required as part of that plan now is they're looking to communities to develop their own strategies because they know better how to engage with those communities. Mm -hmm. And it's just something that right now we have a very um, piecemeal and haphazard way to do that. And it always ends with like, well, you need to contact church groups to do those things. And we just feel like we could be doing better. Um, and how do we do that? And how do we engage people to develop those policies that say what's really going to work and mm -hmm. that's what we want to try to do you know maybe i'm dreaming a little bit that we'll figure out how to do that but i would like to at least try and figure out where that's going to go and um it's not just because we're getting killed on grant applications and losing five points of grant application but we are yeah. but it's not unique to other communities but we just we have such an involved population in so many of these things finding ways to get their participation 
I think we really think is important. As a matter of fact, I have a three o'clock meeting to talk just about this. <laughs> and Jeff, before, people. before we dig into questions, can you also just touch on how you're trying to translate? You know, it, it's not just points, but it is, you know, the, the criteria are trying, trying to drive a change in culture. And much as we are trying to, a capital program, trying to drive uh, department heads, putting these into a, a capital improvement program, and then being rewarded for it by getting points, by basically planning ahead. How can you maybe give an example of what you're thinking would allow you to translate these individuals who are in geographic areas to be involved somehow in a particular project that has nothing to do with their particular area so that the town can advance its goals, including with the environmental justice points? Sure. So I, I think the harbor plan is the perfect example of this, right? Is we all use the harbor in some way, shape, or form, whether it's to go on or off island from the boats. Uh, to go by, you know, access there to get on the water just to get to your boat, uh, to go fishing, to go swimming, to go shell fishing, all of those things is setting people up for successful use of those areas and finding out where our knowledge gaps are for people that are using those resources, but also to find out what they also would like to be doing, right? Like what what more could we be doing to to do that? And it's just an area where we don't historically see engagement with the communities in these mapped areas in participating in those decision making processes. Um, and it can be difficult because then it's always difficult to on the back end of it when you get into program implementation and program rollout, you find areas that won't be as successful because the communities most impacted weren't engaged early on, and then you're kind of chasing your tail. Uh, we also find too, and I, I know this is going to be interesting, when we talk about water quality and water quality impacts, there are also a lot of cultural practices that aren't local to, to just Nantucket, but for where a lot of these folks are from, whether it's, you know, Europe or Central and South America or Asia, like, everyone practices a little bit different is finding ways to connect for people to understand that they can be having an impact where they are on the harbor. You know, you might live in the harbor watershed and not even realize it that when you are, you know, flushing chemicals or paint or whatever is going to go down that you're having that impact mm -hmm. and finding ways to get that messaging into those communities is always challenging. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, I, I think it's one of those that once once that relationship is is made is it gives opportunities for other programs that the town may be offering to kind of follow along and and get into as well uh, and really improve our you know program offering to to areas that aren't honestly receiving the same amount of services that other areas are mm -hmm. thanks jeff questions for jeff on this one jill and then Derek. i hear you kind of talking about recreation Yes. <laughs> and I wanted to know if that is an element of this plan, like finding out where their these communities are maybe disenfranchised with recreation, maybe their recreational needs are different, um, or their access is just unknown, or we're not providing the right recreation indoor or outdoor. Is that something that could kind of be included in this as well? I'm always looking for ways to like bring these communities together. So I think absolutely, right? I think that speaks to the applicability across other town initiatives that hopefully this would get to. Um, I mean, obviously, this is focused more on that direct interaction with the environment and those things, but I absolutely think that that includes, you know, how we're developing our outdoor natural resources for parks and open spaces for, for people to do, right? I think yeah. environmental justice should be a significant component of you know open space planning and recreational planning to right. really meet what the community is looking for right is I, I don't know we talked about it in my house the other night as a matter of fact it's like you don't need to build a second hockey rink if people want to play baseball you need to build baseball time yeah exactly but you need to know which one you're going to build before you decide you're going to set off and build it because the people that decided to do that may not know and this is really just a well, where How that they, is might right. be important so that they, it's convenient. And yeah, and it's you know, access to public transportation. And, 
Uh, and it's, it's also something we've talked a lot about with the land bank too, to be perfectly honest about when they're acquiring properties and developing, you know, parks and recreational opportunities. Like, are there areas that make more or less sense? Um, so I know this is something that they're also very interested in because this is something that comes up a lot for them for how people are accessing their properties too. So right. I think the hopes would be that it could be pretty universally applied. And, you know, I, again, I feel like once you foster those relationships, hopefully you can get engagement in areas that those people are interested in as well. And right. you kind of build a broader network. Mm -hmm. That's the hopes. Right. Uh, Barry, and then... So to a large extent, I, I, I work in this in the human services space in terms of community engagement with underserved populations. Um, trust is probably the most important thing. It is um, people bring cultural heritage around uh, their relationship with government from their countries of origin. Um, and when it's government reaching out, um, the trust barriers can be higher than they we might expect them to be if we were born and raised in the United States and understand that we have a place in government oh. that other folks don't really understand that they do. Um, the other thing, um, the meeting people where they are, which is why it's always, we'll reach out to faith communities, right? But there are other um, places and ways that people in our diverse communities gather. The most obvious example is Tom Nevers, yeah. you know, yeah. for oh, athletics oh, and so forth. Um, and frankly, it's a matter of community organizing, which is not how government usually operates. Um, it is, to my mind, I'm just sitting here listening and thinking, you know, do we need to create a, a community, a committee, a government committee that is just about this topic mm -hmm. for a period of time and invite people to serve just to talk about how we do this, how we yeah. engage and and um, determine the needs of people who who live in these environmental justice neighborhoods um yeah so much to unpack yeah uh, it's a lot around this and it and it's it again building trust is challenging um in and of itself mm -hmm. i think we're doing a much better job in multilingual communication since COVID across the board in town town government mm -hmm. uh, mike burns did a great job with the transportation survey he he you know he produced cards that he distributed to all the markets, food markets on Nantucket that were printed in Spanish and in Portuguese separate mm -hmm. with QR codes. And he got a really high turnout rate, higher turnout rate in the multilingual respondents, not as high as we ideally would like, but that's just testing strategies and seeing if they work is, is really, we need to be much more proactive. And I think right. the DEI office has a role in this too, so. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Good point, I'm gonna follow up on that, Mary. Yeah, so that leads me to a few things. Mike may be a very good resource for you because we've been dealing with environmental justice here, you know, multiple transportation plans for the better part of 10, 12 years. Yes. So some of that work may already be there for you. Um, you know, I'm glad we touched on the fact that one thing that was a very good success story was coordinating now with the new communications department to be able to meet some of that criteria by getting himself in multi uh, multi-language criteria for other people to be able to respond. Um, the, what I might encourage here, and I'm not sure where it starts at, but DEI has to really take a central role in this now because you're gonna have environmental justice things, probably housing has got environmental justice things, transportation has environmental justice things, I'm concerned that, you know, we're, we're running off into these multiple directions, yet here sits a newly created department that really should be coordinating that, and they should be coordinating with the expertise that each one of you bring into it. So as, as opposed to you just being saddled with an environmental justice plan that you have to do, really, I see them taking the lead initiative in coordinating all of these and then begin to figure out where do the differences lie with certain things like natural resources, like transportation, like housing. Because um, otherwise there's going to be a, a tremendous amount of duplication of effort, blood, sweat, and tears put into it. Um, 
I'm not saying I, I would, you know, you're still going to need money from your to your department to make this happen. So, Absolutely, but I'm just I'm a little worried that 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 is not coming into play at the moment, and I'm not sure how to move that up into its next level so that um, it's a much more cohesive so, process for the town. I can actually answer that question. So yeah, I, I know it's a little deceptive that everything gets labeled in in its perfect little box, and this one is in right. the natural resources box. So in the last year. Um, the new kind of sustainability office was moved into natural resources to get, get off the ground and get rolling. And one of the big goals of that office is to, you know, be the hub of the wheel and get everyone together. So when we went to even submit this before we submitted it is it was vetted through um, health and human services. Yep. It was vetted through DEI. Uh, and we talked to Kamal and very specifically, we asked Kamal, we said, is this something that you want to do? And he said, I want to do it. I don't have the bandwidth to move it forward right now because I'm implementing my DEI plan and doing that. If this is something that you guys can pick up and get started, I would really appreciate it. So we said, absolutely, we'll get it going. Okay. And he will absolutely participate and deal with that. And, and Mike will. And I know we've even talked to you know everyone. We've talked to a few folks from, from Plus, like Holly and Leslie about it. And it's something where it's not just in the natural resources box. Is right. it something that, you know, we took a lot of good time and care to make sure that a policy that's going to affect almost every department in some way, shape, or form wasn't like we're going to sneaky do it in natural resources and tell everyone what to do. Is it was very much like we all agree this is something that we have to tackle and we have to deal with. Okay we need to get started doing that who is going to be the one that's lucky enough to get to sit through the you know two hours of budget planning and getting it to town meeting and getting it through and then when the real work begins you have a team of people that are ready to go and i think because of sustainability we were the uh lucky short straw drawer of who's going to champion this through knowing that the first the first time it comes up if, if, if funding is approved for it this group gets replaced with Jericho and Kamal and um, you know, obviously someone from Plus will probably have Lauren for, for energy concerns that come in because I know she deals with with that kind of stuff a lot. Yeah. Um, I was going to say we even talked to Tucker about it, but now that Tucker is taking a bit of a shift, right. um, whoever takes that job would probably be involved, but it's something where we just wanted to make sure that we got started and that people had the bandwidth to deal with it. And I think we're in a good place for it. Right. So uh, go ahead. Oh, I, was just, I just hope that you involve the parks and rec office because I think that's probably where a lot of, you know, areas are. It's a great way for outreach. And he really, I think Charlie really knows what some of the issues are. You know, there's a lot of abuse that happens out at Tom Nevers and it's not nice. And like that, you know, he, he knows where all that is. I think he could really give a lot of feedback. So just a couple. Definitely. Um, our, what's DEI to start with? Uh, diversity, 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 equity, and inclusion. inclusion. Yeah. Second question is, I think I heard what you said, but why is the whole effort being housed under your umbrella, or is it just specifically being uh, related to to environmental issues that's being housed under your umbrella? I'm kind of going to where you were. So right. So when we look at diversity, equity, and inclusion. It may be like the broadest umbrella that we really have within the town. And, and probably second to that is uh, our new fancy bus term where we use sustainability. And those two go together and, and they definitely have their fingers in all town programs and all town initiatives. And you can break up DEI into a million little boxes or into 10 little boxes, depending how you want to. What's kind of come forward is the state and federal government have put forward their goals and initiatives. And one of them is obviously through the area that hubs through our office more often is environmental justice because right. of access to things and environmental resiliency that it's not a box that you can really break up or you know run and hide from anymore. It's something that we have to start addressing. And as we were going through 
kind of available personnel and resources to start dealing with it and folks that had expertise in this area. We thought that putting it with sustainability, which happens to be in natural resources right now, made the most sense for staff resources wise to at least get through the early phases of, you know, budget planning, what's it going to cost? What should the, you know, what should the team look like? Who is involved? Who has time and want to participate? Or how will that set up? Someone always has to be that lead person first. They may not be the lead person at the end, but someone has to do that first. And when we talk to who we felt were the major stakeholders in the town at the time, our decision between that group of folks that it belonged with sustainability right now. And very well, I would 1000% agree that ultimately it probably ends up in DEI and it probably goes there. But when we talked to Kamal, he was very much like, you guys go, get it going, and I'll be with you 100% of the way. And then when we get to the end of it, maybe the, the rest is spot for that. Uh, go ahead. Well, why don't you finish up our and then we'll go to Brooke? Because I, I had a series of questions. So the, the, the money that you're asking budget approval for is really related to environmental issues under that umbrella. Or is it broader? Is it money related to the implementation of an entire social justice program? concept yes to both i think is the the short answer where the lens of environmental justice obviously is is set at kind of a a narrower window in scope of what you're engaging with in certain ways and then obviously when that broadens out some for how you're going to implement those programs is it may spread out but i also think one of the benefits from it is it also starts to build that relationship with those communities where it may spread into other areas of more likely, let's see if I get this right, I'll ask them all later. You would enter into more areas of inclusion better because you would be building that trust association and group and involvement relationship um, to engage those communities. And it's not to say, right, like the state could change this map tomorrow and we might not have six, we might have 10, or we might have two, right? It, 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 whenever they update that, but I think it's more, we need to have the program, regardless of whether there's six or eight or 10 sure. to, to engage folks. Let me rephrase the question, because I thank you, I get what you're saying, is that funds that are here specifically focused on environmental justice, or is it focused on an entire social justice program implementation? The, the primary goal would be for environmental justice. Was it efficient to do that versus doing what you suggested, which is so can, other people can, can we can I because I wanted I wanted to jump in earlier because I, I think there's a component that's being missed here that yeah, is, there is. Right. this is this is a, this money and correct me or confirm is an approach to addressing how to appropriately assess um and develop a policy under natural resources <laughs> with respect to this as a component of each of these requests that will come in. So it's not as if natural resources is looking to develop an assessment and a policy for the town. They're specifically looking more at, this is kind of a new area that the state is bringing in. Moral and ethics aside, it's a component of every request. And they're they're trying to develop through a professional resource who's conversant in this area. How do we, in our specific circumstances as a natural resources development dealing with coastal resiliency, hazard mitigation, and so on and so forth, how do we how do we go about what's the what's the, how do we assess and develop a policy for how we will address environmental justice when we're moving forward with our projects and our goals. So it's it's compartmentalized. It's the first step in, it's compartmentalized to uh, yeah. about a broad topic that's national and state and townwide. But at this point, it is with respect to specifically natural resources projects, correct? 
that's it's more than that. That's a pretty good description. I, I think the one part that's difficult with it is obviously the state and federal government have unfortunately made the decision for a lot of us that they've broken DEI up into some larger programmatic areas. This is unfortunately one of them is this environmental justice component. Mm. And I, I will 1000% agree that all of those programs need to be developed in a more broad social program to engage all of our, all of our groups, you know, with, with fair and equal access across the island. This is a piece of that. This is the piece that our department is most involved with because it's, we manage natural resources. That's what we do. So, after Jeff. no, I, I I think that's really it. But I, I think your description is is pretty sound in that regards. I just think that you're going to end up with a policy, obviously, that sure. has a lot of ability to overlap with the other boxes that have been yeah. created. Okay. Right. It, right. The way I was going to say it is, you're creating a model that can be applied to other areas on the island, and the impetus for doing it in natural resources is. It's getting in the way of getting funding. There's a yeah. there's a real driver to do it in this area because it's you're losing grant opportunities because this work hasn't been done. Yeah. So it's a the best place to start is the place you need to start, which yeah. is here, right? Absolutely. And then Howard, I think the thing that's really important is the context of this nationally is environmental justice is meant to address a long-standing and very terrible history of um resources being in 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 equitably expended at the expense of communities that are represented by the metrics that the government has found to measure them we don't really feel it here on nantucket to the degree we we feel it in a city like boston where they ran a highway through us or other cities where they took interstates and bisected communities of color and you know our lens here is a little less egregious than it is in other places but nevertheless as we decide on how to spend money, are we spending it in Pulpus and while we're in it, or are we spending it in Mid Island? That's right. how I look through this. And yeah. how do we assess right. that? Yeah. What, how do we assess that we're fairly allocating our assets to people who are, uh, by the government standards, struggling more than others? Yeah, I should let Brett talk first. That's yeah. well said. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Right. And in this instance, through the lens of nat natural resources. Right. right. Interactions in that level, yeah. but it's going to um, be a tool for everybody. To well, use. so I just wanted to really briefly speak to that. I mean, Brooke mentioned committees and groups. We talked about, uh, you know, it's not our purview, but we're trying to get our arms wrapped around this as a matter of understanding. We talked about who's the central authority or administrative body. Is it DEI? Um, there was a brief mention of the communications uh, department. I mean, the way I see this evolving, uh, I think Brooke said, is you know you go to where the you start where you have to, and part of that in this instance is going to be a bottom up type of an approach where the individual departments, beginning with natural resources, are are taking a look at how this applies and how it can apply and be applied to develop equitability with respect to their own department. The next step, in my mind, would be that um, as the capacity of the town evolves, and I'm not, I'm not putting a timeline on it, but these individual plans that are helping the individual departments could then be reviewed globally with respect right. to perhaps the work group and or the select board, and then you can better determine who is the department or the town resource who can best administer this. And it may be that it's determined that it's a decentralized and a centralized hybrid model where certain aspects stay with the department because they need specialty consultants addressing certain aspects because they're so specific for their needs. It's kind of administered under the uh, DEI and obviously communications would be involved. Um, and that's down the road. I guess really what I wanted to say was, um, and I don't think you will, you're you know, you obviously you know, understand what's involved with this and for our discussions yesterday in the past, Jeff and his department reach out and communicate with other departments um, to a to a good and appropriate degree. Um, but don't lose sight of what other individual departments have accomplished. And that may be where for the intern, 
the communications department comes in because they're the one who's tracking like what Mike Burns did with transportation and, and, and they can measure the data points on how successful was this particular initiative versus later on someone did a different initiative but we didn't get the feedback. The only way to get that is through a central repository and it seems like for now communications is is maybe the place that they have the bandwidth. Um, we're not in that department. Um, right. This is a new thing, so we've kind of stepped out outside of our guardrails. I think is a matter of understanding, but um, interesting topic, a lot of room for evolution, and um, I'm sure we'll see a, a lot of developments in this area. Sure. Unless there's any pressing, I want to move on because we still have school. Yes, and it's uh, almost two o'clock now. Um, baseline environmental data program. Uh, Jeff, I guess for me, if you could just speak to that concept of what baseline means to you versus what it might, for instance, mean to someone who's in finance or others. So if you just explain your definition of baseline. Sure. So baseline for us is just our most basic information necessary to put forward management recommendations or programs over time is it's our we need to have a basic understanding of what the environment is telling us. This is it. I know it's each year, right? Each year, right. Is for us, data sets have to be continuous and correct. So it's not like we can take a water quality measurement this year and say, well, we'll go check it again in 10 years because it is a very dynamic system. So it's not something that you could do that. So for us to, to maintain things like statistical significance, to you know, kind of stay relevant and really just to keep people informed for what's going on. It's stuff that we do at its most basic level every year. It's the like guarantee natural resources is gonna be collecting this information every year. That doesn't ever say that we may be looking at a project in the future where we need to do some sort of you know specialty investigation or monitoring in advance or add on an area that we haven't been sampling or doing something from to address a specific project. Uh, this is the, we want an understanding of what's going on in our systems island-wide at its most basic level. And then it gives us that good start to look into specifics. Okay, thank you. And the reason I wanted to bring that up is baseline in some other common parlance, it's kind of a one and done. And um, how it, re how that, how Jeff is approaching it and what they're referring to as their baseline is obviously you just said year to year or annually, but the relevance of that is that it is a request that would be coming in front of us annually. Every year. So it's, yep. if there was any incongruity with, with in people's minds, why baseline data needed to be done every year, it's based on the use. I, I will say historically really quickly, this is a program that we have funded through gifts and donations and things over time. Mm -hmm. And we finally just hit kind of a critical mass a couple of years ago. We we're like, we have to reliably be able to do this and had a really long talk with Libby and Brian and saying, I'm going to ask for a good chunk of money. And this is why we have to be doing this. Mm -hmm. And mercifully they agreed. And, and we talked to, um, talk to you guys and I I think it's really important for us because it's what connects people to the resources in a way that hopefully people can understand and I love to have projects where I, I hate to make it sound like my fifth grade science fair project but this is we joke about all the time is I love to say this is what we know this is what we're changing this is what we know now mm -hmm. did it work did it not work and to be honest with yourself and say, no, it didn't work. So maybe we didn't look at it the right way, but you still have that solid data that goes with it. So you can make your best informed decision and measure your results and have that over time um, and look at those long-term trends too. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dylan, uh, well, that's what I was gonna ask. I'm just confused more about the funding because I thought we were already doing some of this. Like we approved a lot of money for the dredging at my comic con because we know that there are problems there. So we have a lot of information. It just, it's $500,000. So sure. are you going to ask for that every year? Is that what you're saying? Yes. But 
and doesn't uh, land council do some of this? Doesn't Great Harbor have a whole fund for so, monitoring the scallops and eel grass now? Or? So the Sorry, first, I'm, I'm, oh no, no, totally. Okay. This is, those are, are good questions. So yes, some of those groups do some of this work too, right? The land council definitely does do water quality monitoring, but they don't do it on any of the water bodies that, that we do. So oh. they stick to areas like Tom Nevers Pond or Washington Pond or Kapon Pond because we're doing the harbors. Some of it's for regulatory compliance purposes. Um, you know, we do groundwater sampling related to the sewer treatment facility too, um, to help those guys out. So for us, we do those basic areas. The eelgrass base scallop and whelk survey, the first year we did it as kind of a proof of concept we did get that outside funded through the Great Harbor Yacht Club Foundation. And then the next three years after that, we funded through a combination of monies from the Division of Marine Fisheries, um, which was their kind of annual appropriation from the state towards Barnesville Dukes and Nantucket County. Uh, and then one year, we also had a private funder that wanted to continue that. But it was giving us our best information on the health of the harbor for us to understand and transmit and for and for folks to do that. And we also wanted to expand that into Madigan Harbor because we were just doing Nantucket Harbor. Mm -hmm. And there is a yearly cost to doing that. And it's something where we find it very worthwhile to really be able to say, we're seeing our scholar populations go up or our eelgrass expand or contract on how that's changing year to year, especially as we've done a lot of different things, whether it's wastewater management or stormwater management or, or fertilizers of those things. Uh, and then some of it's also just filling in holes. Like we don't do Which nutrient, like, uh, we don't do nutrient sampling within groundwater outside of what Wana Comet does for the public wellhead. And that's something where by doing that on a yearly basis, we can try to give smaller groups of people goals and objectives in their own neighborhoods to have a greater impact than what a town-wide program or implementation may be able to do. So it's for us being able to really justify the expenses we're putting forward to do other programs or to help out places like sewer and stormwater to say, hey, where are we going to get the best bang for our buck? We know where we are going to be able to go and do that because we have the information up front because we've collected that and we know the information. Help them make informed decisions. Uh, what, what can you come back to that? Um, thank you. I, I apologize. And through the chair, I just wanted to mention that um, the school folks are going to have to leave in 15 minutes. We have um, to we have an emergency meeting to talk about heat index in our schools. I uh, in the future, if possible, we'd love to go first with Capcon if that if that's possible. Okay, so um, if you're able to 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 keep if if you're able to to break your uh, conversation and have us go, that would be fantastic because we've got to leave in 15 minutes. Uh, uh, I think what we'll do is we're, we, we will reschedule you. Yes. Um, and I think um, we, we, you know, we we determine that we, we can get into an offline discussion about who goes first and why, but it's typically just uh, luck of the draw and the discussion goes the way it goes. And that's why we don't put an end time in the meeting. I understand you have an emergency meeting. Totally understand that. Let's, mm -hmm. you know, we do have some flex dates in our schedule for these purposes. So why don't you guys go offline and go ahead and uh, reach out to Sue, please. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be before your, your emergency meeting, but reach out to her maybe later today and um, she and I can work on plugging you back in. Thank you. It's just, help. it's always helpful and it's past practice. We've always been first on the agenda because then we can get on with business for the day. So thank you. I appreciate that. We'll, we'll talk with Susan and reschedule. Okay, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Um, okay, Peter, thanks for playing that on us. Yeah. yeah there, I wish I could get it. Good thing. I got to get a screen here so I can see what's on the screen there. Um, anyone before Jill gets a second bite at the apple? Jill? I'm, well, no, I'm just, no, I'm not fine. understanding. I feel like we have some of this information, but you're saying that you, you don't. No, they update it. We update it every yeah. year. Right. It's yeah. there's. But you've been updating it through grants or through other things and now you want to have a direct funding source annually correct you've just been like kind of cobbling it together through your budget or something yes or grants smoke and mirrors and now you want to have a line item is that what you're correct kind of saying 
Yes. And we this, I mean, just to for purpose of clarification, this isn't a new line item. It's just we're I, I wanted to clarify my understanding of baseline when I went into this was a little different than how Jeff uses it. Not that one is right or the other, it's just different use in different parlance. Mm -hmm. So I I was thinking that this was more of like a two-year baseline. Find out what the information is. Like a study. And you have it in a file and you can use it. But the information they're using and they need to update on a regular basis for it to have value. That's part of one part one of the comment I want to make. Part two is that again, my understanding, confirm or correct, is that some of these things were being funded by others, some of them were being funded through donations or whatnot. Some were being funded through their operating budget, but in conjunction with establishing a line item, the data set has been expanded so that it's not correct. simply what was right. previously being done, it's it's a more expanded. Absolutely. Process. I mean, if you go back, just rewind 10 years, we were really only doing TMDL compliance then. Mm -hmm. And since then we've added in groundwater, stormwater, uh, eelgrass, base call of things. Uh, there are always areas that come up that we want to address further. I think there are other contaminants of concern that will probably come up that we'll be looking at as well. Um, some of it obviously will be outside of our lens a little bit, maybe in health and spots, but it's also for us, one of the things that we like to be able to do is if we know we're securing funding for a lot of these things, it also lets us secure folks that either may be helping us process data or even collect data in longer timeframes mm -hmm. to even have like sampling continuity is something that's really nice to have. Yeah. Um, because we do when we even do evaluations like this for base golf surveys, there's a difference between if I go and do surveys, if our shellfish biologist Tara does a survey, and if the researcher that we've historically used, uh, Steve Heck out of Stony Brook does it, there's a different quality of data that's collected and we try to minimize that difference. Um, and if we know we can do that over periods of time, it's always super helpful. And also, honestly, we've definitely found over time that locking up some of these contracts over two or three year time periods saves us money because like our contracts that we've had now, inflation was way higher than I think people were projecting in their three year runs. And we probably ended up saving money by having you know, three-year contracts with a lot of these folks where we'll be paying for it on the next one, I'm sure, but uh, it's definitely saved us some in the, the short term. Okay, thanks, bro. Uh, I'm curious, I, I'm going to ask it as a question, but it's kind of more of a rhetorical statement. It seems to me that if you're doing good research and you're monitoring trends, you're also making wiser investments in other capital expenditures or other programs and plans. That's the hope. So we stuff. save money in the long run. Yeah, I think that's, you know, that's the plan, right? This is actually, we had a good discussion on this yesterday too yeah. about this, that the, the value of making informed decisions is, a, it's not just, it's a dollar value. Yeah. I and mean, there is a dollar value component. To I mean, we, we say, and we've been talking a lot about pond openings, and I know that's not part of any proposals today, and, and the cost for that's pretty minimal. But we are really trying to moving away from the, well, we do it because we've always done it, right? Right is, well, why? What benefit are we really getting? And, and like, we've really started to work with um, some outside groups and we have a, a lovely doctoral candidate that's working on pond openings with us right now to say, are we doing it the right time of year? Yeah. Are we, what tidal conditions or can we now use these data sets from offshore buoys and looking at wave climates to better predict how successful our openings are gonna be and maybe the way we're opening it make sense for certain parameters but not for others how can we broaden that look to maximize our chance for success and measure it and then see the water quality impacts or maybe it should be once a year twice a year five times a year is we are in the business of in natural resources we need to know the why before we get to the how and how much. and how much because the last thing I want to do is to sit in here and be like, I need $2 million for a project. And I think it's going to work because, you know, when I talked to everyone around the island, when we did this 30 years ago, it worked really good. We think, 
Yeah. It's not good enough. That was hard last year with the Nyakama Con dredging. Yeah. And I think we had some information, but it was. So dredging projects are kind of interesting and not to like get into the weeds on it, but since I'm not wasting the school's time, I'm wasting it. Over, but it's fine. Then it's here. <laughs> is we have the data set behind Mayakama Pond and can look at its long-term water quality trend and then also look at where the sources within that pond are coming from and seeing that a lot of the nutrients within that pond are coming from the sediments within the pond mm -hmm. and know that. And then we can also tap into, there's been a pretty extensive amount of research on the impacts of dredging as far as benthic loading goes. So it's not like it's a, it's not an unproven science or something we're pioneering where we can reasonably predict what benefits we'll be getting from that. Um, I will admittedly say, communicating all of that effectively to folks is an area where we probably struggle the most mm -hmm. because you're asking a bunch of people who nerd out over those numbers and those things to be like put it in a really nice easy way to think about like your friends and family understanding and not going right. like oh my god they're the nerdiest person ever <laughs> it's hard you're asking scientists to not be sciencey and, and be communicators but it's been great to have like florencia and those folks um, help with that and say, how do we put this in a package? And honestly, it's the best result of our eelgrass and base gallop surveys because it's something that everybody can understand easier to know. Hey, I used to go scalloping out of Fooling Mill and I could get a box in 30 minutes right and you can't get there anyway, <laughs> right? Like people understand that and see it and having real numbers that go with that and then trying to connect to the more science-based number behind it for the people that are interested is a really powerful tool um, for our department. I don't want to necessarily get into the weeds of how we how we operate, so we'll bore everyone to death, but um, we find great value in it and, and find that it hopefully saves money in the long term for, for us in our decision-making processes. Now, I wanted to, one of the uh, utilities of this came up in our discussion yesterday is that through the use of this data, it can be used to spotlight issues. So, for instance, yeah, you know, issue no one's not aware of, it's the immediate field grasp. But then it can be used to target potential solutions that can then influence policy and spending dollars. And by example, one area is nitrogen loading from runoff, another area is septic. And it really gives us an opportunity to try and um, target solutions around the around the harbor, and in other instances. And so we're wisely spending our dollars and getting more value per dollar. Um, the question I wanted to ask, uh, Jeff, you mentioned this, and I didn't catch it yesterday. You mentioned sewer beds, um, doing some testing there, um, stormwater. I guess. Um, it sounds like we have nat natural resources testing, some amount of sewer, and we may have some stormwater. My suggestion to you, and I think that if Brian were here, but Sue's listening, is if those numbers that your department is providing testing services rise to a substantive number, and I think the definition of a capital request is $50,000, not just in terms of carrying it in a line item, under the same request number, I think it would be beneficial to kind of break it out by department so that we can track that number in our own mind's eye and our own discussions. Um, it's just, it's, it's a certain amount of accountability literally on paper, but also in terms of how we process the information versus $500,000 in natural resources. Is sure. it 50,000 sewer, 50,000 stormwater? I'm not saying currently, but I'm just in the future. It might no, be something that we can now is breaking those out. And then the individual department can kind of talk about them a little bit too when uh, David's in here on sewer or the stormwater. So that's just something moving forward. Um, any other questions uh, for Jeff on how? How does um, next year's budgeted number compare to what your budget is for this current operating year? So the 500,000 for this one. So like I said, we, we try to fix those costs for periods of time. So when we originally developed that $500,000, it was taking either existing contracts or existing quotes, 
pooling them together and then knowing that we can lock up things for a certain period of time and holding that number solid with a little bit of um, admittedly a, a little percentage of just in case. And then we also, we build in every year we've been doing, especially water quality sampling, something always comes up that we don't expect for testing purposes. Uh, this year, like we had an excessive amount of, of harmful alpha blooms. So we did some additional testing related to those that we hadn't anticipated. There is a percentage of that number too that we hold for um, kind of like a rainy day fund for, we know we're gonna test something, we're not sure what that's going to be right. yet, but it's going to be something. Two years ago, it was. How does this so number much. compare with the current year's budgeted number in real dollars? It's, I mean, it's the same. It's, 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 and are you expecting to use the full half million or is it not yes. enough? Yes. No. Right now, it's enough for, for what we are doing. I would say in the future, if things come up, we'll probably change the request a change to that number but it is currently this year that we're currently within and what we are already scheduling for next year will reasonably fit within that five hundred thousand dollars this number is not handicapping anything that you foresee at this point no i will say if, if the bosses want us to look into something else sometimes that changes Thanks. but we'll ask them for money when they tell us to test for something else again this is our basic basic understanding if it's something above and beyond or specific project driven that's probably something that we've included into that specific project so thank do. you that's great um just a uh, just a quick comment on our process i encourage you if you don't necessarily do it now but keep an eye on the rory criteria if you're when you're previewing requests if there's just since those are the values you're putting in you're assigning values to those particular criteria. Um, you, by reviewing that sheet after you review the subject matter, you may find, oh, I'm not quite sure I understand that. And then it'll, you can remember to ask the department head over here. Just, just a, kind of a, we've been doing it for a while, so we think to do this. Um, the other thing is, I, I don't know that in, uh, unless there's a material point you want to make, Jeff, we need to get into out years. But I want to make a comment on the out years. Um, and that comment is, so we talked to uh, Jeff yesterday and our, you know, one of our primary goals is to be getting projects that are of merit into the capital improvement uh, program list for out years, primarily as placeholders if they're more than three years out, but just so that there's general awareness. We all have an understanding, maybe we haven't discussed it as a group, um, that that's a double-edged sword. On one side is broadcasting to people who will look at the plan that these exist. Um, on the other hand, it, it raises a lot of questions. And the problem with that edge of the sword is that it's so early that some of those questions can't be answered uh, by the department head. Um, with that in mind as to why we want to have uh, requests of merit put in in advance, I you know spoke with Jeff about it yesterday and I was really pleased with the rationale he provided as to why there aren't of, he has a list, a long list of, of goals and objectives which inform their projects. But where they are um, in their process, and again, confirm or correct as you feel free, um, is that they have different plans, programs, and studies, and they're waiting. Some of these are evolving and maturing. Mm -hmm. And as they evolve and mature, they're developing their list of capital requests once they feel more comfortable with the ability to prioritize them. So I just so you're the reason I bring it up is one is general information that that's something we're looking for from department heads, um, and two the kind of rationale that Jeff's department is to, as the department head is he's approaching it. I personally was comfortable with that um, because to the extent putting in requests that may not actually be what the ultimate request is to meet the goal or objective, yeah, better to not be premature on it. So I thought I would just mention that to you because the next step we would have in our process of a meeting is discussing out your requests. So that was relevant in that regard. Jeff, if you have anything material you want to spotlight, and then if you do great, you can ask questions. And then if members have a particular question on an out your request, 
We'll entertain those, and then we'll get a motion to adjourn that level. I think you summed that up pretty well. So, any one question on the out here request? Um, I'll note that if there's a dollar value, there is going to be typically some type of a backup detail in the database, so you can refer to that. And then Jeff, I would ask. I think I didn't look at it. I'll admit because we've had it prior years. The baseline uh, program data program. If you would be so kind, if it's not in there, to upload the last finalized version or a draft sure. version as a detail, I think it's beneficial for us to see what what's included in that on a detail level. Um, and then the same for any of the other programs. It's just a matter of policy and practice. If there's a plan, if you could include a link or um, uh, it can be loaded to the database. I realize some of these plans are pretty uh, megabyte heavy. So if it's just included as an URL on a single page PDF with the different plans and programs, and then we can click to access it in the top yeah, server. I think that it's usually how we do that. Okay. So I'll, I'll make sure we have all that stuff in. So sorry, a lot of rapid discussion uh, or comments on my part, but it's in deference to your time and uh, kind of what was in providing information, but at the same time moving us forward to the next step. Questions for Jeff? On others? Okay. Um, yeah, Jeff, any... Joe? I don't no. think Jeff has any out years. He only, I mean, except for. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I don't have any. The baseline program, which you're. Well, the pond the part thing is double right? Yeah, pond is yeah. and. Uh, There's a few that are there. Covered. Um, I... I think just to touch on them really quickly, a lot of those projects like the Matic and Long Pond hardenings are the, the culverts out there. The Wall Bennett Road, Pulpus Harbor Hardening is another similar project to those two. Is we actually originally had them scheduled for this year and we've pushed those again for different reasons. But while we it for um obviously there's very active talks about bike path and some work on that roadway that spending money to talk about how we're gonna harden that corner may substantially change with that. So kind of pushing to there. And then Matic, it's the, the same way, but for sewering projects and some water and sewer infrastructure. So before we did that too, is we definitely checked with, you know, I checked with David about where they were on sewering kind of time frame for that and try to sync up um, and talk to Mike with the Wall Winter Road Bike Path for where they were in kind of that planning process. Um, we try to push that, and then something that that we also take into account for our planning is also we have a lot of plans that are just coming online, like the Coast Resiliency Plans now two years old. Um, our plan is going to be finished hopefully this winter, early spring, and we'll get a whole new list of goals and action items from there that aren't accounted for in this yet. Um, but we also try to put projects forward that we also know that we have the staffing bandwidth to handle and do because I think the last thing we want to do is to put a project out there and then not do it because we don't have the manpower to manage it and um, it's something we try to take great care and account to not right. overwhelm but still progress going forward. No, very helpful information, John. Um, well, thank you for coming in. We appreciate your time. time. Thank you. you know, you're all busy. Um, we're going to quickly go through uh, green sheet. Uh, just so you guys are remember, green sheets are basically if there was um, as the uh, liaison from the select board or anything you see, if there was some type of a topic that we wanted to get direct communication back on. We, one year we worked up as one of our best practices a form. So that it can be documented and then forwarded or brought to your meeting, you know, to be sent to you, and you can as a reminder, basically, because you all do like committee updates on your agendas. Um, nothing rises to that level at this point, but um, I think we've only used it a couple of times. Uh, good at the order is just uh, chime in at any point that's done in the meeting if you think we're going astray or we're doing something well and we can do a little bit more of this or that. Feel free to chime in. Uh, data next meeting is uh, Tuesday, September 14th. That's Thursday. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think you're right. Tuesday's the 12th. Yeah. Thursday's the 14th. Thursday, September 14th. I think that's just an artifact from our some of our Tuesday meetings. Cut and paste. 
And um, with that, how about a motion to adjourn? So moved. On your motion? Oh, all in favor of Aye. 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 Would anyone really be a part of the Well, that's a mention. Thank you. Thank you.